Okay, well, we're moving on to Chapter 5, which has five sections. The one that we're going to spend the most time on is 5.3, and uh, then probably 5.1 and 5.2, and then less time on the last two um, sections. The last two are basically using the formulas to solve problems. The part that requires the most thinking is 5.3, and the one that's most useful for future classes. Okay, so section one is using fundamental identities. So what are the fundamental identities that we have so far? So here's, this is out of your book. We have the reciprocal identities. The sine is the reciprocal, the cosecant, the cosine is a reciprocal the secant, the tangent is a reciprocal of the cotangent, the cosecant is a reciprocal of the sine, the secant is a reciprocal of the um, cosine, and the cotangent is a reciprocal of the tangent. Okay, so those are reciprocal identities. Uh, the next thing is we have the quotient identities. So we have the tangent is the sine divided by the cosine, the cotangent is the cosine divided by the sine. We have the Pythagorean identities. So we've got sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared, 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. And we've got these cofunction identities. So these are basically reflecting how the sine and the cosine functions are very similar to each other. They're just offset by this um, horizontal displacement. So we're going to, you know, if you think about a sine function, the cosine function is the sine function with with it uh, shifted a certain distance horizontally. So these are all horizontal shifts, basically. And then we've got these odd even, even identities. So sine of negative u is negative the sine of u, whereas the cosine, the cosine of negative u is equal to the cosine of u. And that has to do with just the general shape of the curve. So if you think about the sine, it looks something like this. So when you reflect this across the y-axis, which is what these negative signs are doing, then you get something that looks like that. And so reflecting across the y-axis is, is the same as reflecting across the x-axis. That's what, that's what this basically says. Whereas the cosine function looks like this. So when you reflect it across the y-axis, it's the same as if you reflect it across the uh, if you reflect it across the x-axis, you would get something like that. So here it says if you reflect it across the y-axis that you get back to your original shape because what happens is this point goes over there and that point goes over there but the same y value so you don't see any difference in the result so that's kind of the idea behind these odd even even odd identities so these are given and what we need to do is be able to use these fundamental identities to simplify more complex functions and so what, again, the whole idea here, the whole purpose of, a lot of the purpose of trig identities is to take a trigonometric expression that I don't know how to, to evaluate in calculus and conform it or transform it into something that I can deal with. And, you know, sometimes it's uh, for people who are just starting out with trying to do this, it's a little difficult. It just takes practice to do it. There's no, there's no magic or anything like that. You just have to have experience. It's like playing tennis. You know, you you start out not doing very well, but you get kind of gain muscle memory. Here it's brain memory. Okay. So here's um, the topics that we're going to cover in this section. Using identities to evaluate functions. So this means. If we know the cosine, can we use a trig identity to find the sine? 
uh, simplifying a trigonometric function. That's kind of what I was just talking about. Sometimes you have trigonometric functions that involve squared terms. So sometimes you factor trigonometric functions like you factor algebraic functions. Uh, sometimes you add trigonometric expressions together and you can simplify them using these identities. Uh, rewriting it so that it again fits into something that we can solve in calculus. And then there's this trigonometric substitution which is um, used again, this technique is used in calculus to, to make something that doesn't fit, to make it something that does fit. So once we get to that, you'll understand it hopefully more. So the first thing is to find uh, the other trigonometric values given one or two of the six trigonometric functions. So here I have that the tangent of x is the square root of 3 over 3, and the cosine of x is equal to negative the square root of 3 over 2. Now you could actually, I think, just use one of these um, to get all the other ones. No, you actually need two of them because if there's two there's two values of x where this is true in, in the entire thing. So you You'd either have to specify this and give me the sign of the second one to know which quadrant I'm in. Or I can give you both values. They just have to be consistent. So looking at you know which quadrant am I in based on the information they've given is the tangent is positive and the cosine is negative. So the only quadrant where that's true is the third quadrant. Why? Because the tangent is positive in the first and third quadrants cosine is negative in the second and third quadrants so they both both of these have a choice of being in the third quadrant that's the commonality so they are in the third quadrant so sometimes you get you know you have a plus or minus the square root of something well you choose the solution that matches the quadrant that you've determined earlier so um, we know that the sine of x is going to be negative because the sine is negative in the third quadrant. So both, both these say it's third quadrant. So the sine is negative. Uh, the cotangent, the cosecant, and the cosecant have the same signs as the tangent cosine and sine. So, um, respectively. So we know all the sides. Positive, cotangent is positive. Secant's negative, sine is negative. Okay, so we know that. We don't know the value yet. So let's see, let's think about what can we do here. Well, the cotangent's easy. Cotangent of x is 1 over the tangent of x. So we just take the reciprocal of that. So you get 3 divided by the square root of 3. And we multiply and divide by the square root of 3. So we get 3 times the square root of 3 over 3, which is the square root of 3. Three is cancel out. Okay, so that's the square root of 3. So that's the cotangent of x, positive. You can do the, the same thing with the, cos, the uh, cosine. So the secant of x is 1 over the cosine of x. So we get 1 divided by negative the square root of 3 over 2, which is negative 2 divided by the square root of 3. So I've just taken the reciprocal of this, kept the negative sign. And then if I multiply and divide by the square root in the denominator, I'll get negative 2 square root of 3 over 3. 2 square root of 3, square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. So that's the secant. Now, to find the uh, sign, or the cosecant, I have to use the Pythagorean identity. So that says the sine of x squared plus cosine of x squared equals 1. So sine squared of x plus the cosine. Well, the cosine is negative the square root of 3 over 2 squared. So I get the sine squared of x. Well, if you square this, the square will get rid of the negative sign, so it's positive. Square root of 3 squared is 3. 
2 squared is 4, that equals 1. Okay, so then you get sine squared, subtract, subtract this from both sides, you'll get 1 fourth. 1 minus 3 fourths is 1 fourth. And then you take the square root. So you get the square root plus or minus the square root of 1 fourth, which is plus or minus 1 half. But since since we are in the third quadrant, the sine is negative. So we take, in this case, the sine of x is negative 1 half. We take the negative square root. And once we have the sine, then you can find the cosecant because the cosecant of x, doesn't matter what quadrant you're in, the cosecant of x is 1 over the sine of x. So you get 1 over negative 1 half, which is negative 2. So those are all the answers. Cotangent is reciprocal of this. Secant is a reciprocal of that. Because the tangent is positive and the cosine is negative, we're in the third quadrant. So I know that the sine has to be negative. So when I use the Pythagorean identity to solve for when I use the Pythagorean identity to solve for the sine of x, and I have this plus or minus, I'm going to choose the one that's consistent with the quadrant. So that's negative, negative one half. Okay, so that's how that works. So those are the um, kinds of problems that you would have where you're, you know, the trigonometric functions. Now again, I could have. You know, let's say I just said the cosine is less than zero. Could I still could I still figure it out? Well, I think so because what I could do is there's this um, I could find the secant. So let's go back. Here's uh, this one here: secant of u. Secant squared equals 1 plus tangent squared. So you can see I, I could solve for the secant 1 plus this squared. So you'd have 1 plus the square root of 3 over 3 squared. So you get 1 plus 3 over 9, which is 1 third. So I get 1 plus 1 third equals the secant squared of x. Let me just add this. Once I get to knowing another trait, you know, you'll see that I can, I'll get the cosine answer here in just a second. Um, with the tangent being positive and the cosine being negative, it's third quadrant. So I know the secant has to, because the cosine is less than zero, the secant has to be less than zero. So what I, what I do is I get secant squared of x equals one plus a third, which is four thirds take the square root, so I get secant of x equals 2 divided by the square root of 3, plus or minus. Because I'm in the third quadrant, so the qu third quadrant, it's going to be negative. So it's going to be negative 2 times divided by the square root of 3. I multiply by the square root of 3 over 3, so I get negative 2 times the square root of 3 over 3. So that would be the secant, which agrees with what I got later here, negative 2 squared root of 3 over 3. So you can see that works out. And then once I know the secant, the cosine is the reciprocal of that. So I take the reciprocal of that, and then if I multiply by the square root of 3 over square root of 3, I'll get negative... 3 square root of 3 over 2 times 3. Those cancel out. I get negative the square root of 3 over 2, which is what was given in the original problem. So you don't need, you just need one trig value and two signs. And then you can work it out through the reciprocal identities and the Pythagorean identities.
you'll get, definitely get some more practice in the examples. But okay, next one is simplifying it. So a lot of times, if you have products, if you just use the reciprocal and the quotient identities, you can simplify it. So the tangent is the sine of x over the cosine of x. So that's quotient. The cosecant is 1 over the sine. That's the reciprocal identity. You can see I cancel out the signs. I get 1 over the cosine of x, which using the reciprocal identity is the secant of x. So tangent x, cosine of x is the same as the secant of x. And this, all these things I'm doing with trig identities apply for all angles, not just not just between 0 and pi over 2 or 0 and 90. Okay, next one, we can use the Pythagorean identity. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. So if you subtract cosine squared from both sides, you'll get that. So for 1 minus cosine squared, I can put sine squared. Cosecant reciprocal identity. And then I have sine squared divided by sine, which is just sine. So you can see in both, the, here I used quotient reciprocal. Then I got an answer. Then I used another reciprocal to get one term. Here I used Pythagorean identity and then reciprocal identity to get the final answer. So. I'm not sure why that's in here. So I, okay, here's another simplification. Usually when you have 1 plus or minus something squared, it means that it's probably involving one of the Pythagorean identities. So that's the one involving sine and cosine. The one involving cosecant is 1 plus cotangent squared of x equals cosecant squared of x. So you can see if I subtract 1 from both sides here, I'll get cosecant squared x minus 1, which is that. And if I subtract sine squared, I'll get cosine squared x equals 1 minus sine squared x. So here, I can replace 1 minus sine squared with the cosine squared. And cosecant squared minus 1, I can replace with cotangent squared. But then, what I can do is I can... So there I use the Pythagorean identities here. Um, probably if I re rewrite the cotangent is so the cotangent is cosine squared divided by sine squared. Cotangent is cosine divided by sine. So cotangent squared is cosine squared divided by sine squared. And I'm, notice I'm dividing this by that. So I take the reciprocal of the denominator. So this is that reciprocal the denominator, multiply it, those cancel out, and they just end up with the sine squared of x. Now you can always check your answers by just plotting the two results. Sine squared, I could put 1 minus sine squared x over cosine squared x minus 1. So let's, uh, let me open up the graphing program. So the original expression was 1 minus sine squared, 1 minus, and I've got to do sine of x squared instead of sine squared of x, but the same thing, divided by, so that's 1 minus sine squared um, divided by cosecant x squared, 
minus 1. And then if I plot my simplification, that's the sine, sine of x squared. 1 minus sine squared over, yeah, okay, I'm going to graph those. Apparently I did something wrong here. Uh, let me go to help here. So make sure I use these right. Cosecant of x. Okay, I've got to use a parentheses. So put a parentheses around the x. Put parentheses around the x. And I did it with sign, so that's okay. So now I'll graph it. Nope, still not that. Opening and closing parentheses don't match. They must have too many parentheses. Yeah, I got an extra parenthesis there. 1 minus sine of x squared. And I've got too many parentheses there, too. Still got it right. Wrong. Oh, yeah, still don't. Still got a problem with parentheses. There you go. Okay, so you can see there are two graphs. There's 1 minus sine squared over cosecant squared minus 1. And so what happens is the second graph overwrites the first graph. So you get you get a result. So it does work out. Okay, so those are using simplifying expressions. Uh, then we have factoring and then using trig identities to simplify. So you can see I have this common factor of the sine squared, and what I have left is cosecant minus 1. But I've got this trig identity which says that involves the, the Pythagorean identity that involves the cosecant, which says 1 plus cotangent equals cosecant squared. So if I subtract 1 from both sides, I get that. So I can then plug, for this, I can plug in cotangent. So I have the sine squared of x times cotangent squared of x. But then the cotangent is the cosine over the sine. So then the sines cancel out. Sine squared cancel out. I'm just left with cosine x. Okay, let's do the same thing here. Now what you can do here is it kind of looks like 1 minus 2x plus x squared. Or it would be 1 minus 2x squared plus x to the fourth. So the way you would factor this, you just you should have 1. You'd have 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. And then you'd have cosine squared of x and cosine squared of x there. So whether these are both positive or negative, you'll get positive. So one, so but I need, an, I have a negative two there, so they're both going to be negative. So one minus cosine squared. So you can see if I multiply this out, I'll get one minus cosine x, another minus cosine x. That's minus two cosine x squared, and then minus cosine x times minus cosine minus cosine squared x times minus cosine squared x is positive cosine to the fourth x. But my Pythagorean identity is that. So if I subtract cosine squared from both sides, I'll get that. But 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared. So I can make that substitution. So I get sine squared of x times sine squared of x, which is sine to the fourth of x. So that's the result. That's the simplification. Okay, now sometimes you're given, uh, it's not quite as obvious, you're given two terms. 
In this case, it says combine terms using common denominator, then use identities to simplify. So you can see this has a denominator of tangent x. So if I multiply the original term here, the first term, and divide by tangent of x, I'm just dividing and multiplying by 1. But now, because I have a common denominator, I can combine the two. So I'll have tangent squared x here. Tangent x times tangent x is tangent squared x. And then I get secant x, secant squared x over tangent x. But then I can use uh, the trig identity that says, let's go back here to these, uh, this one here, 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. So let's write that down and then come up with what our substitute. 1 plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x. So that's the Pythagorean identity. So if I subtract, if I subtract secant squared from both sides and subtract 1 from both sides, I'll end up with that. So this goes to the right-hand side, becomes negative. This comes from the right-hand side. The left-hand side becomes negative. So the numerator is negative 1. And the denominator is the tangent of x. And then finally, I can use the reciprocal identity. So that becomes minus the cotangent of x is the result. So again, I'm going to try to prove this is true by plotting them. And the reason I'm plotting them, too, is that you can see it's good for all values of x. It's not just a certain limited domain. So I get tangent of x minus se secant, of, secant of x squared divided by tangent of x. OK. And then that's, I'm going to compare that with minus the cotangent of x. And again, you can only see one curve because the blue curve is overriding the red curve. And it's good for all values of x. OK, and this, the next one's the same kind of deal. <clears throat> and then, I've got the graph there just to remind me that if I plot them, you'll see that it, uh, hopefully we can figure out which trig function it is. I mean, look, if we plot this, it looks like either the um, secant or the cosecant. Remember the secant, the secant of x is 1 over the cosine of x. And the cosine of 0 is 1, so it's not the secant. If you look at the cosecant of x, that's 1 over the sine. And the sine of, say, pi over 2, <coughs> the sine of pi over 2 is 1, so you get 1 over 1, which is 1. So this, this point here would correspond to the cosecant. So it looks like it should be the cosecant. <coughs> so let's, uh, let's just try to prove that by trying to simplify this expression. So the first thing we probably could do is rewrite the uh, cotangent as the cosine over the sine. Next, let's find a common denominator. I'm going to combine these two, cosine x times cosine x, cosine squared x over sine x. But then if I take the second term and multiply the numerator by the sine and divide the denominator by the sine, I'm just multiplying by 1. Now I have this common denominator. And you can see what I have. I'm just going to change the order here. So you get sine squared plus cosine squared over sine but the sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So I get 1 over the sine, which is equal to the cosecant of x, which is what I thought it was. So that agrees 
with what I get if I plot this function. And then the final area is trig substitution. So what you do is you have this x is, e, is some function of a trig function. And then we're going to substitute that in here and then try to use some trig identities to rewrite it, simplify it, and then write it back. So what you would do is we're substituting x for some trig function. So you get 2 secant of theta quantity squared minus 4. So that's just substituting x 2 secant theta. And then you square both parts. So you get 4 secant squared theta minus 4. And then you can factor out the 4. 4 times secant squared theta minus 1. Um, and then if you fa you can take the 4 out of the square root. So the square root of 4 is 2. And then this looks like one of those Pythagorean identities. So let's, let's remember what that is. I think it was 1 plus tangent equals secant squared. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. You can go back and check it if you don't believe me. So it's 1 plus tangent squared of x is equal to secant squared of x. So if I subtract 1 from both sides, I'll get secant squared of x minus 1. So I can put in um, 2 square root of tangent squared of x. But the square root of the tangent squared is just the tangent. So I get 2 tangent x. And I think that's it. The other thing you can do here is if you solve for the secant, the secant is x over 2, so you can, you can make this triangle. So theta is there, secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, so this is x, this is 2. So if I use the Pythagorean theorem, I get 2 squared plus y squared equals x squared, y squared equals x squared minus 4, y equals the square root of x squared minus 4, so that's equal to the square root of x squared minus 4, and so these are all consistent now using the Pythagorean theorem, so if I wanted to look at um, the tangent, the tangent of theta, is going to be equal to the square root of x squared minus 4 over 2, or 2 tangent of theta equals the square root of x squared minus 4. That's kind of what I just did. The square root of x squared minus 4 is the same as 2 tangent of x, or 2 tangent theta. It should be theta. So you can use these Pythagorean identities to get the same result you would get using triangles. Okay, <laughs> now the next one says use a graphing utility to solve for theta where theta is between 0 and 2 pi. So the way you solve this problem, <clears throat> like you do, a lot of these is you, well, all of them you could solve this way, is you take the thing that you're trying to solve for this equality as a whole, and then you create a function that has both parts, all parts of the function on the same, same side. So. What I'm going to do is say y equals the sine of theta minus the square root of 1 minus cosine squared. And then what I do is I look for the x-intercepts. So where does y equal 0? And you can see that easily on the graph. You can see the here's the picture of the graph. 
Um, so here's the uh, graphing program. So you have, you write in the sign. Uh, in this case, you'd use the sine of x because that's the variable that they use. The sine of x minus cosine, uh, what was it? Was it the square root of cosine? Yeah, minus square root one minus cosine of x. Cosine of x squared closed parentheses. Okay. Um, another closed parenthesis. So let's see, make sure I have this right. Cosine, here's the right left parenthesis, there's the right parenthesis. I think I might have too many on the right hand side. Because I got one, two on the left hand side, and three on the right hand side. So that's that's not right. And I'm going to go from zero to two pi. And it didn't like that. Maybe I didn't get it right. Cosine of x. I guess really, I guess I really don't need this parenthesis. So that's that's what the function looks like. So um, you can see from zero to pi, it's true. But from zero, from pi to two pi, it's not true. So the answer is. When does the theta, when does this apply? Well, it applies when uh, the angle is between 0 and pi. Now, what this graph shows actually is the two functions. So the, the, the red curve would be following the blue curve here, and then it becomes the red curve, blue curve, red curve. So that's the sine. If you take the square root of 1 minus cosine squared th theta, you get this blue curve. And you can see between 0 and pi, they're equal to each other. They're the same. So there's two ways of doing it. You can plot this, y equals the sine of theta, y equals square root of 1 minus cosine squared theta. Find out where they either intersect the, um, well, in this case, where they're the same, which is from 0 to pi. Or you could create this function y, which is sine of theta minus the square root of 1 minus cosine squared theta. And where this is, where this is 0, the function thing is satisfied. Okay. And the final one is this, and if you take physics, you'll see this for sure. So we have a, what's called an inclined plane. And then on the inclined plane, we have a block of some kind. And this block will slide down the inclined plane if um, the angle is high enough. In this case, we're assuming the angle is high enough. And one of uh, Newton's second laws says that the uh, force um, what we're looking at here is that uh, the friction force is going to balance the um, force due to the weight, but the weight is acting straight downward. So what you do is you break it up in two components, one that's normal to the surface and one that's tangential to the surface. And the, this tangential force is equal to the weight, W, times the sine of the angle theta. And the friction force is equal to the weight times the cosine of the angle theta times this thing called mu, which is the coefficient of friction. And it says solve the see, solve the equation for mu and simplify the results. So they're asking, well, how do you calculate mu as a function of the angle? That's ultimately what it is. So we have this equation: mu w cosine of theta equals w sine theta. And you see we have weight on both sides, so we can cancel that out. So you get mu cosine theta equals sine theta, or mu is the tangent of theta. So that's the final result. And ultimately what you use this for is you can use the angle at which this thing just starts to slide to figure out what this coefficient of friction is. So if the angle is low, too low, it won't move. If it's too high, it'll slide uh, immediately. But there's some angle where if you start tilting this thing up, it'll just start to, s and that angle is 
theta. So let's say assume um, well, actually that's all we have to do. <laughs> okay, we don't know how to do the rest of it at this point. We will by the end of this chapter. What this is saying is that um, what did we use? Chapter 1 or Chapter 5, Section 1, we used the quotient identity to rewrite the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta as a tangent of theta. So it's a pretty simple um, situation. Okay, so that's it for Section 1, Chapter 5. So please watch the examples video to see how to work the problems in this section and then print out the homework. Try the homework. If you get stuck, you can go to the video.